morning. Good Welcome. Good morning. We are delighted to have you all here this morning. My name is Ellen Rosenblum. I will be the moderator of this program. I'm the Attorney General of the State of Oregon. So I've been told by my panelists here today that they may start asking me questions, but I'm actually the moderator. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, but I'm very delighted to be uh, welcoming our panelists and all of you to this really important topic today, State Attorneys General and Federalism in the Obama slash Trump eras. Uh, much has been made about the effectiveness of State Attorneys General when it comes to taking advantage of states' rights and federalism concepts in litigation, particularly in the past year and a half, but before then as well. So we have a fabulous panel today. I want to tell you a little bit about each of them before they each make a brief presentation to you. And then we're going to engage in some Q&A, some back and forth, hopefully some questions from our audience, and hopefully leave in an hour and a half having a little bit better understanding of what federalism is all about in this day and age, and whether it's a good idea. So let me uh, start with uh, the introductions. To my immediate right here is Bill Hurd. William H. Hurd, formally, but we know him as Bill. He's a partner in the Richmond, Virginia office of Troutman Sanders, and he's focused on his firm's appellate practice, and you'll understand why. He previously served as the first Solicitor General of Virginia from 1999 to 2004. Altogether, Bill has appeared on brief in more than 130 appellate cases, and he's argued more than 50 times before federal and state appellate courts, including the United States Supreme Court. Bill served as lead counsel in the statewide election recounts for Attorney General of Virginia in 2005 and 2013, and he served as legal counsel to the 2011 Independent Bipartisan Advisory Commission on Redistricting. Uh, he also is an adjunct professor uh, and teaches classes on topics such as the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. To Bill's right is Misha Saitlin. Misha is the Wisconsin Solicitor General, so that stayed up to the north. Uh, he became the solicitor in December 2015, and he previously served as general counsel in, in the West Virginia Attorney General's Office, so he has experience in several different AG offices. And there he specialized in litigation, uh, challenging unconstitutional and otherwise unlawful overreach by the federal government, so very on point for today's discussion. Prior to uh, serving in the West Virginia Attorney General Office, uh, Misha was an associate in the Washington, D.C. Office of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. He has, most notably, among his many accomplishments at such a young age, uh, clerked for the United States Supreme Court uh, for Justice Anthony Kennedy. I think we've all heard of him. Uh, he also clerked for the Honorable Janice Rogers Brown on the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit in Washington, D.C., and uh, for the Ninth Circuit, um, Judge Alex Kaczynski. So that is uh, our second speaker. And last but not least, to my left is... Uh, I'm doing research, by the way, so just so I don't see you <laughs> No, no, not at all. Yeah, checking his emails here, uh, is Dan Rodriguez. Uh, Dan is the Dean and Harold Washington Professor <laughs> of Law at Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law and he has been there since January 2012. He will be completing his services dean this summer at the end of August, and he'll be moving on only for a year, and then I think coming back to Northwestern, hopefully. Uh, you better be. Uh, but he's going to be going on to Stanford and to Harvard next year uh, to teach and do some uh, much-deserved sabbatical uh, time. Uh, and of course, Northwestern Law School is very close to my heart because my father, Victor Rosenblum, taught there for almost 50 years. So delighted to have uh, Dan with us. Uh, before joining Northwestern, he served as, uh, as a chair in law at the University of Texas, <coughs> Austin, uh, at Rice University's uh, Baker Institute for Public Policy, and as dean and uh, distinguished professor of law at the University of San Diego School of Law, as well as professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley. So, as you can see, uh, incredible credentials for our panelists and speakers today, and we look forward to a fascinating, interactive conversation about this very important topic. So with that, we'll begin with a little bit of history, uh, starting with Bill. Thank you, Ellen. Well, to start our discussion this morning, I thought I would 
give a little background on federalism as it stood prior to the beginning of the Obama presidency. And the best way to start with that is a quotation from Justice Kennedy, a case he concurred in some time ago. He said, federalism was our nation's own discovery. The framers split the atom of sovereignty. It was the genius of their idea. Now, our citizens would have two political capacities, one state and one federal, each protected from incursion by the other. Now, it may be debatable how much states are protected from incursion by the federal government, but in any event, that was Justice Kennedy's explanation of the basic concept of federalism. Under this approach, the federal government is not a creation of state governments as the Articles of Confederation were, and state governments are not creations of the federal government, like counties or cities or creations of the state government. Instead, both the federal government and the state governments each draw their authority from the people. Uh, state governments from each political community as a state, and the federal government from the combination of political communities that voted many years ago through conventions to ratify the Constitution, and then of course adding in additional states to the process the Constitution prescribed. The Tenth Amendment is often cited uh, as a basic tenet of federalism, and it is. And that amendment says that the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, or reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. So as between the federal government and state governments, the federal government is supposed to have only enumerated powers, powers expressly or implicitly given to it, while states have complete power, plenary power, except insofar as their own state constitutions or the federal constitution says otherwise. But in practice, the federal government over the years has worked very hard to try to become a government of general powers. And I want to talk about how it has done that. There has not been uh, much resistance, although some. There's not been much resistance from the federal courts. Indeed, the federal courts have sometimes made, in my view, incursions of their own into state sovereignty by often overly expansive applications of the 14th Amendment. But perhaps the chief culprit in the incursion into state authority has been by Congress, and it has been by exploiting uh, three particular clauses of the Constitution. The first of these, sometimes called the Elastic Clause, uh, better known as the Necessary and Proper Clause, says this. It says, Congress shall have power, quote, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by the Constitution in the government of the United States. Now, this broad language was interpreted early in our judicial history, in the case of McCulloch versus Maryland, 1819, when the issue was the constitutionality of the National Bank. And in that case, Chief Justice Marshall wrote, let the end be legitimate, let it be within the scope of the Constitution, and all means which are appropriate, which are plainly adapted to that end, and which are not prohibited, but consist with the letter and spirit of the Constitution are constitutional. Now, in subsequent years, uh, the phrase consists with the letter and spirit of the Constitution, in the view of some, has been overlooked, and there have been instances of legislation by Congress approved which does not consist with the spirit of the Constitution insofar as it trespasses into areas of state primacy or areas that are integral to the operation of state government. Secondly, there is the Commerce Clause, 
which when you read it in the Constitution seems benign enough, Congress shall have power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with Indian tribes. But in practice, this clause has been very broadly interpreted. There are four kinds of ways in which Congress can legislate and be approved by the courts under the Commerce Clause. There is first the regulation of the channels of interstate commerce, roads, waterways, airports. Secondly, there's the regulation of instrumentalities of commerce, vehicles, steamboats, airplanes. Thirdly, persons or things in interstate commerce, goods being shipped across state lines, people moving across state lines. And finally, those intrastate activities that substantially affect interstate commerce. Now, what does that mean? Perhaps the most extreme example of congressional legislation approved under this concept of affecting interstate commerce is the 1942 case of Wicked versus Filburn. And in that case, there was in place a federal law that limited how much wheat could be grown. And in order to grow wheat, you had to have an allocation. Well, one farmer grew wheat not to sell in the market. He grew wheat to feed his own family. And the federal government cracked down on him and said, you did not have an allocation to grow that wheat. And even though it was not his intent to sell it, it was his intent to feed his family, the federal government said, you're being fined because you do not have a quota to grow wheat to feed your family. And the Supreme Court upheld that, saying that, well, if he grew his own wheat, that meant he wouldn't buy wheat from somebody else, and that would affect interstate commerce. And so the punishment of the farmer was upheld. Uh, that strikes some of us uh, as being a tremendous example of federal overreach. It says, in fact, well, if I grow tomatoes in my backyard, the federal government or the state government can tell me I cannot. Uh, that would seem extreme, uh, even if it were the state government to do so. But for the federal government to tell a farmer or a family what they may grow to feed themselves is certainly inconsistent, I would suggest, with the spirit of the Constitution. Thirdly, there is the spending clause. Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. This clause has been interpreted to allow Congress to spend money for the general welfare of the country, uh, even in areas where it cannot regulate or legislate directly. Uh, Congress does not have power, for example, to give a, a state prisoner more religious liberty than provided by the Constitution to that prisoner. But Congress can, perhaps the word bribe, perhaps the word extort could be used, Congress can effectively compel states to do its wishes with respect to prison religious rights by threatening to withhold federal grant money used for the operation of prisons unless the state complies with the federal regulatory scheme. Congress does not have the power, probably not, to set a national drinking age, but in the case of South Dakota versus Dole, the Supreme Court said, well, Congress does have the power to say, if you want state highway money not to be reduced, then you must raise your drinking age to the level set by Congress. Now, in that case, South Dakota versus Dole, back in 1987, the court did impose some limitations, conceptually at least, on what Congress can do when it imposes conditions on the acceptance of federal money. First, uh, the court said, well, it has to be in pursuit of the general welfare, uh, but that doesn't mean a whole lot because the court also said that courts should substantially defer to congressional understanding of what general welfare would Secondly, the court said that the state's receipt of federal funds, if qualified, 
the qualifications must be unambiguous so that the state, in effect, entering into this contract with the federal government, will take your money and we'll do what you say. The what we will do what you say part has to be very clearly specified so there's no ex post facto uh, effect, uh, no surprise in the deal. Third, the court has also suggested that the conditions might be invalid if they are unrelated to the federal interest in a particular national project or program. So, for example, while there is arguably a nexus between highway funds and drinking age because people drive on the highways, uh, if they abuse alcohol, they're going to be a danger to interstate commerce, uh, it would be perhaps uh, unrelated if Congress were to condition uh, compliance with a drinking age uh, and something, well, say, uh, uh, money for law enforcement. That might be unrelated. Operation of prisons, uh, perhaps some health care programs. So there has to be a germaneness category. Uh, and finally, the court said that there must be no violation of some other constitutional prohibition for example, the Establishment Clause. You can't use the spending clause to uh, uh, contribute money generically to uh, houses of worship, for example. Then having gone through those limitations, the court later on in its opinion comes up with something that actually is, is perhaps uh, more useful. The court said that in some cases, the financial inducement offered by Congress might be so coercive as to pass the point at which pressure turns into compulsion. So there is, in that case, at least a prospect that when the states are being compelled to take the federal money and subscribe to the congressional mandate, that that might be unconstitutional. There are very quickly some other limits the courts have recognized, the Supreme Court has recognized in, in dealing with Congress even outside of the spending clause realm. Uh, the court has said if Congress intends to alter the usual constitutional balance between state and federal governments, it must make its intention to do so unmistakably clear. And finally, uh, a case from 1997, a no commandeering principle. In that case, the legislation at issue involved the Brady Act which of course governed the distribution of firearms and the act purported to direct state law enforcement authorities to implement the act. The Supreme Court said no, uh, you cannot commandeer the resources of the state to implement the federal program. Uh, and so uh, that part of the Brady Act was, was struck down. So as we go into the beginning of the Obama administration, those are the, the basic principles that uh, provided for a very expansive interpretation of federal law, but with some limitations recognized by the court uh, in terms of, of uh, what Congress cannot do. Uh, and with that, uh, Thank Misha. Thank you. Let's move on to uh, Misha. Thank you for that uh, mm -hmm. historical perspective, Bill. Very helpful. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much, and thank you, uh, uh, General, for, for your uh, kind introduction here. Uh, we heard a little bit about uh, potential problems with congressional overreach. I'm going to talk about uh, something that I think is an even more immediate problem uh, in today's uh, political realities, um, I, uh, where where Congress is often uh, stagnant and does not act, which is that uh, which is presidential overreach, presidential unilateralism and the threat the presidential unilateralism has uh, to, our, uh, to our federalism system and a uh, at least um, somewhat successful federalism solution that certain states attorneys general have used uh, over the last um, uh, six years or so. Uh, as, as many of you may recall, in the, in the Federalist Papers, uh, when the uh, Constitution was being sold to the American people and there was concerns that uh, one branch would overreach uh, and trample upon the uh, authorities of other branches of the federal government and of the states. Uh, the uh, Alexander Hamilton, I believe, he talked about how you would have uh, ambition counteracting ambition. If you had one branch overreaching, trying to go too far, another bra branch 
would step forward and push back, push back so that one branch wouldn't get too, uh, wouldn't get too out of line. Unfortunately, in um, I guess I don't have to speak as loud anymore. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in, especially in the 20th century, and even more so in the second half of the 20, uh, 20th century, that system has broken down. And the reason it has broken down is that the ambition of the executive has remained uh, at, at its high point. In fact, I would argue has increased. Uh, presidents are generally willful individuals. They get there because of their willful character, and they want to accomplish certain things. Unfortunately, individual Congress people Senators, congressmen often don't, their ambitions are not um, generally or often tied with the power of the, the body which they sit. So sometimes they're uh, in the same party as the president, other times there's just gridlock. So what has happened uh, as the 20th century has rolled on is that presidential power and presidential authority, ability to act unilaterally has, has increased, where Congress has often sat on the sidelines. And I think that in the uh, prior presidency, the presidency of uh, Barack Obama, we saw kind of the uh, logical conclusion of this. Uh, what happened in that presidency is that President Obama had a very ambitious agenda. At the beginning, he had a broad congressional support. He managed to pass a couple of laws that he signed. Um, but then the political fortunes of his party changed, and Congress was no longer in the president's view solving the problems that he diagnosed uh, as Specific. He tried to campaign uh, on some of these problems. He tried to you know, go to the people, but it didn't work out. He lost congressional majority. He lost first. He lost the Senate. Then he first lost the House. Then he lost the Senate. So he was not able to get um, the laws he wanted passed in several areas, and areas like energy or environment, uh, like his cap, failed cap and trade system, uh, areas like immigration, uh, in the failed comprehensive immigration bill. So instead of Accepting the verdict of our political system, which is supposed to have that gridlock, supposed to have ambition, counteracting ambition. What the president did is he said something very dangerous. He did it very colorfully. He said, I have a pen, and he lifted the pen, and he said, I have a phone. And what he meant by that is, I'm no longer going to bother with laws. I'm going to enact transformative change in this country, in, uh, in energy, in uh, land use, in immigration, through executive action to executive unilateralism. Now Congress had not acted, so he should not have been able to do this. But Congress was not, because of the nature of Congress, it was not able to bring the full weight of some of the authorities that um, I think the founder intended. For example, going further than not enacting laws and actually defunding certain actions. But of course, when the, um, when the Federalist Papers were talking about uh, multiple sources of power under our Constitution. They were not talking just about Congress, they were also talking about the courts. And also, while not in that particular passage, they were also talking about the role of states in our uh, dual sovereignty system to push back. So what the state's attorneys general did, uh, um, after the President Obama tried to use his pen and phone to tr have fundamentally transformative change in our system without going through the lawmaking process, is they brought suit in the federal courts. And in fact, they managed to stop probably the three most ambitious initiatives to, um, that the president attempted to enact through executive unilateralism in the, se in the second half of his presidency. First, uh, the president, um, through his uh, EPA, attempted to enact what, what was uh, known as the Clean Power Plan. And what this was, it, it was, it was fairly audacious. The, uh, the Clean Air Act, allowed under a provision called 111D, says that um, EPA can basically give instructions to states to regulate emissions from certain, certain categories of, of, of um, emitters, uh, source categories, uh, in certain limited categories. Now, the problem that uh, the president of the EPA saw is that they wanted to fight climate change. And doing what the statute allows, which is to set certain regulations on what power plants could do and uh, what would emit uh, from their, um, their smokestacks, was not going to achieve 
what in the president and his administrator's judgment was sufficient to combat this problem. After the president failed to get cap and trade, uh, what, him, what he and his EPA did was they said, well, we're no longer going to say power plants can't um, emit a certain amount of carbon dioxide. What we're going to say is what our power to regulate power plants means is that we can say you can put power plants out of business and force the replacement of them with renewable energy. It's no longer a, re no longer a regulation of the emissions. It's now just a replacement. And how is this going to be done? Aha, we're going to do a cap and trade system. So basically, uh, the failed legislation, cap and trade, was transmogrified into an agency rule enacting the same exact thing. Now, 27 states sued in the federal courts uh, saying this is illegal, and, and they prevailed. In fact, at the United States Supreme Court, uh, the United States Supreme Court issued a, a stay, a block of that regulation which is, I think, the first uh, time a, this U.S. Supreme Court has ever blocked a federal regulation while it was still pending in the lower courts. So that block by the U.S. Supreme Court kept the Clean Power Plan from ever going into place. Uh, uh, President Obama's um, EPA also wanted to have broad authority over all water and land use management in the country. The tool they had was the Clean Water Act, and the Clean Water Act says that the federal government has authority over navigable waters. And what the EPA did is they issued a rule. They said what navigable waters are are not, only, are not the Mississippi River, just that. It's anything that has any impact on those navigable waters. And how do we define any impact? Well, if, well, if it impacts the waters, of the navigable waters in a once in a hundred year flood, no kidding, once in a century rainstorm, we're gonna say that that is forever, not during those rainstorms, but forever under federal jurisdiction. Again, the state sued in federal court. This time, 31 states, a bipartisan coalition of 31 states. And again, those states got that, that illegal rule blocked. And finally, uh, the president was frustrated uh, President Obama was frustrated by his inability to get um, comprehensive immigration reform. And some activists said, hey, why don't you just um, issue an executive order um, basically legalizing the same category of folks after the legislation failed, giving them work permits, et cetera, et cetera. And the president at first said, well, I'm not a king. I can't do this unilaterally. Uh, and he said this repeatedly, repeatedly. But eventually he got frustrated. <coughs> And eventually he signed the, the very executive order that he said a couple years before he would be a king-like figure inside, basically giving work permits and legal status to four uh, million illegal immigrants. And the, the, the state sued, this time 27 states sued, they got the, uh, that illegal order blocked, and it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court, after the passing of Justice Scalia, divided 4-4 on the case, we don't know exactly what issues they were voting on, but they divided 4-4, and so that, um, that illegal program got blocked. And I think that while there was some dismay from the president's supporters at the time that the states had such success blocking the president's three key signature initiatives uh, in his second term, I think what has happened since should cause those critics to rethink uh, their dismay at that time. Because presidential unilateralism and the power and initiative of courts at the request of states to stop that kind of overreach can cut across administrations. And I think some of the folks that were so unhappy about the success that the, uh, the right-leaning attorneys general had in stopping the unilateralism of the last president may have felt a little better about that, felt a little better about the court's willingness to step up oh, presidential overreach um, uh, in last November. And I think we've seen a little bit of uh, action on the other side of the aisle now, uh, making some of the same arguments, using the same, some of the same tactics. And without weighing in on the merits of any particular pending lawsuit or whatever, I think it is a good thing that state's attorneys general have stepped into the breach where uh, the Congress has, has 
fallen down in, in its responsibility in the, uh, in the ambition, counteracting ambition. And I think it is, a good court, it is a good thing that courts are open to hear those kind of arguments. Thank you. All right, <coughs> we will now turn to Dean Rodriguez. I feel like Rip Van Winkle. We've gone to sleep at the end of uh, January 2017 and woken up to a world in which we should thank the good Lord for the Trump administration for restoring the equilibrium that was seriously destroyed by the Obama administration. If this was a tweet and there was a sarcasm emoji, that's where I would place it right, right now. Uh, uh, so, and I'll come back to that. Uh, uh, much, much more went on uh, under the, uh, the Obama administration and then the two ill-fated actions and activities that Misha mentioned and certainly much has gone on since. So, but let me, let me put it in context. I really have sort of two uh, agendas or objectives in, 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 in my remarks and, and the, the advertisement promised fireworks, so I hope to live up to that in some, in some fashion, although Chicago bans fireworks, I should point out. And one is to, is to put a, a little con, uh, content and context on, on what's been going on, right? Some data, as it were, with respect to uh, this question of whether or not state AGs are really uh, much more active uh, uh, along these lines than, than in the past. The, the spoiler alert is yes, they are, by any measure. And second is to try to t tie it back to what it should mean for, uh, for federalism and how we might think about it, something that is likely to come out in the, in the, uh, the Q&A. So on the first, what's going on is more frequency. Uh, uh, by, by all relevant measures uh, of what? Of state AGs uh, engaging in multi-state litigation against the federal government. Uh, not uh, only directed at the president, but uh, in large terms directed at the presidential administration broadly defined, which of course includes federal administrative agencies. Put to one side the important complex debate about the so-called unitary executive. So let me just say that lawsuits against the presidential administration, I'm calling uh, uh, to include uh, uh, the president directly, uh, as in, for example, the travel ban litigation, but also federal administrative uh, agencies, whether single members or, uh, or so-called independent, and also against the federal government uh, general. To put a little bit of flesh on, on that, uh, in the uh, Clinton administration, the eight years of the Clinton administration, there were 18 uh, multi-state uh, uh, lawsuits brought during that uh, that time. That was actually, not to, not to be misleading about it, that was actually low uh, when compared, for example, against the Reagan administration, but it was in the general ballpark, and it, and it, and it actually uh, uh, was uh, very much the trend for the administration before. That ebbed and flowed, that's basically what was, what was going on. There were uh, uh, 45 during the period of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Bush administration, a significant increase, right, more than double. There were 59 multi-state lawsuits, to, to, to Misha's point, certainly uh, a significant ramp up in the number of multi-state uh, lawsuits during the, uh, the uh, Obama administration, uh, across a range of suits. He mentioned some of the suits invo involving the environment, the Clean Air Act, uh, uh, and, and the like. Greg Abbott famously what said, as, as Attorney General, he's now, of course, the governor of the state of Texas, I go into the office, I sue the federal government and I go home. Uh, sort of a, a pithy description of a, of a trend and a tendency, again, among state AGs, but to put a somewhat finer point on it, those, and again, I, I, I use uh, Misha's words, certainly agree with this, more right-leaning uh, AGs, or a fair, fairer way to put the point is, AGs that, uh, that are in more uh, red states. Uh, now to the Trump administration. Uh, as of last month, there had been 46 uh, uh, multi-state uh, lawsuits in a, of course, a, a much shorter time. Query whether that trend will continue. If I were a betting uh, a person, which I sort of am, I would say that number will uh, will uh, will accelerate. Uh, so uh, there's a trend line, a a, a significant uh, increase in the uh, uh, the use by state AGs of these multi-state lawsuits, almost without exception. Right? These are joining forces among. Uh, state uh, AGs. They can range from, as they have, just to take a few of the lawsuits that are pending or recently completed, uh, from as few as three or four AGs. So, for example, very recently a lawsuit was filed, uh, uh, actually in the last few days, uh, challenging uh, the SALT deductions, state and local uh, tax deductions, uh, uh, under, the, under the Tax Reform Act. Uh, this may have changed 
this morning for all I know, but at the time there were, I think, I believe only four states that were involved. I say only four states, but four uh, states uh, uh, under their AGs. I'm gonna talk about the 3D printer litigation and ask General Rosenblum a question about that a little bit later, but, but that lawsuit was, uh, <laughs> she'll, 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 I suspect, demur, but that lawsuit was brought uh, 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 very recently, a few days ago, uh, by a state AG, by the state, uh, by the AG of the state of Washington, uh, specifically, and joined by seven others. But so, so there are a range from 20 or 25 uh, AGs to uh, to a small number. But there has been quite a lot of, uh, of of activity. You know the topics because the topics are very much in the news, and you particularly know them as lawyers uh, because uh, uh, some of you, both on the dais and in the audience, have been involved in these. They continue to involve uh, issues of environmental protection, say a little bit more about that in a moment. The travel ban uh, uh, litigation, of course, uh, was uh, quick uh, out of the box and conjoined with uh, many, uh, not, uh, uh, I suppose depending on your perspective, most state AGs. There were lawsuits, uh, speaking of immigration, involving the census and the counting of citizenship. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, certainly, lawsuits uh, uh, involving uh, the, uh, that, uh, that statute, the, uh, the, uh, the repeal doesn't quite capture it, but you get my drift, that is the curtailing of, of key parts of the ACA. The DACA uh, uh, litigation, certainly, uh, uh, Dreamers Act, taxes I mentioned, uh, separating uh, children uh, in the context of immigration. So uh, a lot of the big uh, uh, hot button issues that uh, by and large involve decisions of the Trump administration. Again, either directly or under the aegis of the uh, of, uh, of, uh, of administrative agencies. It's very important to draw this distinction. I'm sure everyone in this panel would agree with that. Lawsuits that involve challenges to the enforcement or non-enforcement of federal law. So in some sense, I was so, I, 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 I thought, Bill gave a, a fascinating, wonderful, comprehensive, I gotta figure out how to do it so I can teach my federalism and con law classes much better than I am now. It was a very succinct uh, 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 description of these, of these kinds of issues. What I wanna add to that, though, is that many of these lawsuits are lawsuits brought by state AGs, not so much under the rubric of federalism, but under the rubric of uh, uh, claims that the federal government is not enforcing federal law. Now, the state has skin in the game, or they wouldn't be bringing these lawsuits, but they are not, if they succeed, uh, bellwethers of a new protective federalism. In some ways, they're quite the opposite, right? They're calling upon the federal government to impose restrictions on states uh, and on individuals within their particular state. So it's, in some sense, it's, it's, it's trying to, to add some muscle to the, to the federal government's operations. Many, many, in fact, most, including the examples that Misha gave, of lawsuits uh, uh, involving environmental, uh, environmental protection are of those quality, right? Please regulate us, or pre not us, qua states qua states, but please regulate as the federal government has promised to do. Now that's not the whole story. There are lawsuits, and the, and the cap and trade lawsuit and other examples of this are about federalism, are about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, seeking to convince federal courts to relieve states of the burdens imposed on them, state or local governments, of the burdens imposed on them on federal law. There's probably no better recent example uh, of that than the law of litigation involving sanctuary cities, right, where the state AGs are, are in, in, uh, coming, I could say intervening, are looking to get federal courts to protect state governments, and in particular local governments, from the impositions that would otherwise uh, exist, not only because of immigration laws, but to put a finer point on it, the position taken by the federal attorney general, right, and the federal administration with respect to uh, immigration and enforcement. So that's the second category. The third category uh, is uh, very much uh, illustrated by a lot of the this, uh, uh, AG action activity, particularly in places like California and New York, right, where the states are looking to adopt particular more far-reaching regulations, like in the area of climate change and others, and are looking to, back to Bill's presentation, to protect themselves, right, from federal intervention under the rubric of the 10th Amendment, anti-commandeering, uh, what have you, in order to protect state, uh, state, uh, state uh, prerogatives. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, I want to just underscore the litigation that's uh, hot off the presses and ongoing. 
it's, and it's actually very interesting. Very interesting, not only is it an observation about, about national policy, but also uh, it'll be very interesting depending on how it turns out. I mentioned just the other day, uh, the Attorney General of the State of Washington, uh, assisted by uh, seven other states, including the state of Oregon, I'm not giving away trade secret here, it's in, in, in the press. In fact, if you want to be really specific about it, Washington, led by Washington, Connecticut, Oregon, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and DC. May not be a, a, a hugely ideologically diverse range of states, but it's very much a geographically diverse range of states. Two days ago, a uh, federal judge in Seattle, federal district judge, imposed a ban on that uh, litigation. Let me just describe it in a nutshell. It was a lawsuit brought against uh, the, uh, uh, the, the dissemination and disclosure uh, through the internet of the plans to build 3D uh, guns out of 3D printers. And the, and the claim was uh, made uh, that that violates the 10th Amendment because it violates the state's ability to engage and regulate uh, gun control in the way that they want to. And all of the di different states in the, in that I urge you to look at the, at the papers file, describe their various gun control measures and suggest that allowing this company, Defense, I forget the name of it, Defense Distributed, distributed uh, uh, to, uh, to issue these particular plans. And it's a claim brought under the Administrative Procedure Act that the way in which the federal government, the Trump administration, has dialed back their, uh, the prohibition on the dissemination of this, of this information has not gone through the ABA, uh, sorry, the AP, APA, brilliantly, <laughs> the APA uh, procedures. The response has been, and it's quite a powerful response, in my humble opinion, is this violates the fir uh, First Amendment. So there's a lot of stages in this litigation litigation to go, and it will be a very interesting uh, lawsuit to watch. Let me just conclude, in the interest of time, on the second point, more to say about this. Is this, is this significant with respect to federalism? And I would suggest it is, and say just three, three quick uh, bullet points, if you'll pardon the expression in light of my comment about guns. Uh, number one is, the, uh, this is part of a valuable, uh, valuable dialogue. And here I want to I uh, ally myself with uh, what Misha said, albeit with his uh, particular focus on the Obama administration. I want to say that the dialogue that, uh, that is illustrated by the growth and the rise of these uh, 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 governor-driven and AG-driven lawsuits is a valuable dialogue, uh, uh, albeit one that is focused on the federal courts, which brings me to my second point, which is where really where the action is, goes all the way back to the framers and continues to this present day, should be in the dialogue that happens within Congress. Right, in the dialogue the, 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 uh, among governors, members of Congress, and, and others. That's very difficult to achieve. And as a consequence, in many respects, these, uh, these lawsuits are end runs around key aspects of the political process. That doesn't make it them noxious. It just means that they will always be a distant second best to engaging in political uh, uh, activity within the, uh, within the national state governments. There's more to say, but I, I think I'll stop there. Okay, wow. Well, they may be illegal in Illinois, but we're going to make an exception today, and fireworks are permitted. So <laughs> I want you to make sure that you uh, challenge each other uh, on some of the points that have been raised so far. I will say that uh, my, my way of, of uh, kind of organizing my day is, is a little bit from, different from governor, former attorney general of Texas. Abbott's. I, uh, I wake up in the morning and I, I check the tweets coming out of Washington, D.C., uh, the orders, uh, what's, what's happened uh, since I went to bed the night before, and then I call Bob Ferguson. <laughs> He's the Washington <laughs> Attorney General. I say, hey, Bob. Have you filed a lawsuit yet? Because <laughs> Bob's always a little bit ahead of the game. He's a, na he's a renowned, uh, internationally uh, successful uh, chess player. So he always seems to be a little bit ahead of the rest of us. So uh, I do, in fact, check in with my colleagues frequently. But more importantly, and this is really important, I think, um, I check with my own staff. And I talk about how Oregonians, because I am the Attorney General of Oregon, have been or may be harmed by whatever it is that, and, and I, I'm serious about this, have, is coming our way. And that is what I look at. I don't stop and think about the history of federalism. And, you know, all respect to all three of the brilliant speakers here this morning. Frankly, I could care less. 
I mean, obviously I want to win my lawsuit, so I have to make sure that I have the right legal theories. But what I'm looking at and what my you know, 55 colleagues, because in fact there are 56 mm -hmm. uh, state attorneys, state territorial and district DC attorneys general, what we all need to look at is what and evaluate is the harm to our people. And whether or not we can, we have standing, frankly. But that, of course, has to do with that very issue. And that's what we did on the travel ban. That's what we do with DACA. That's what we do with, with uh, public safety issues, such as the uh, 3D printing issue, which is one that I think has been kind of dormant. And people are just suddenly waking up to the dangers of being able to print, which means make a plastic gun that has absolutely no serial number on it, no way of tracing it. It is illegal in most states to make such a gun, but it's not illegal apparently, at least allegedly, to post instructions on how to make the gun. Uh, so that's what that lawsuit is in fact about. Yes, it may you know, be about federalism, states' rights, all that good stuff, and I loved uh, Misha's comment at the end of his very provocative talk where he said, you know, I'm actually kind of glad that the, that the, he didn't use the word Democrats, but they're the Democrats, our Democratic AGs are now taking a page from the playbook of the Republicans. And that is in fact what has happened. Uh, we're like, hey, they were very successful in these cases and we can be too because we're kind of in it together. This is about states' rights. And so let me now be quiet because as I said, I'm just the moderator, but I happen to have a role on the national stage, if you will, right now uh, in light of these questions. So I kind of can't help myself, especially when my friend Dean Rodriguez uh, suggested he was going to question me. So maybe I beat him to the punch. So let me ask him a question. And I'll also, of course, address it to uh, the other panelists. So federalism, it often has fair weather friends. We support federalism when we don't like who is running the federal government. We don't care about federalism when we support who is running. Do you believe that's accurate? And have the state lawsuits against the Obama and Trump administrations supported or contradicted that view? I, I think, I think uh, there's no doubt about it that there is a fair amount of fair weather federalism. Indeed, as, as someone who has uh, profitably uh, uh, recourse back to the Federalist Papers and the debates in the framing, this is not a new insight. There was a lot of fair weather federalism that went on among the framers. And so we've seen the, the, the yin and the yang of, of, uh, of devotion to states' rights and to, to federalism uh, uh, bounce uh, among Democrats and Republicans in various ways. And we've seen a lot of the, 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 uh, the strong commitments that I think we have as lawyers right, to, uh, uh, under our views of constitutional democracy to federalism, often be swallowed up in the heat of issues involved, hot button issues at a political level on both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the aisle. So I think that, uh, that uh, uh, what we're witnessing now, I mean, you have, always have to have the, some danger, as historians warn us, about drawing too many lessons for events that are literally unfolding on a daily basis, but a, but a fair amount of, uh, of a strong commitment to uh, national uh, action. Uh, make uh, America great again, not make the government and the governments of the various states that great again. And I think that is uh, not unique to this administration. And uh, the point about presidential overreach uh, is uh, 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 a one-way ratchet in some, in some <laughs> significant ways. And I think that's, uh, that's particularly uh, problematic. Now, to, to the question of whether it's connected to the, uh, to the AG lawsuits, there's a point that ought not to be missed in all this, and the folks who write about it, of course, don't miss the point. Uh, the state aid, and, and, and Ella put her finger on it with respect to her own commitments as a representative of the citizens of Oregon. State AGs are elected offices.